Lord be with you. Today's lesson is going to be lesson four on our small catechism series. Uh, before we get started, let's do what we always do. Let's begin with a word of prayer. So turn to page 32 in your catechisms, how the head of the family should teach his household to pray morning and evening. In the morning when you get up, make the sign of the cross and say, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. And be reminded every time you make that sign of the cross, you are a baptized child of God. Praise be to God. We're going to be talking about baptism today. Let's uh, confess the creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. All right, let's just jump right into it. We're going to do some review. Old Testament books, let's say them. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. How many books is that? 39. What, are the, what language was the Old Testament written in? Hebrew? A little bit of Aramaic. All right, let's do the New Testament books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. How many books in the New Testament? 27. What language was the New Testament written in? Greek. All right. Uh, let's talk a little about the church year. What's the first season? Advent, then Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, Trinity. What color is Advent? Blue, Christmas, white, Epiphany, green, Lent, violet, Easter, white, Holy Trinity, or festival, I always get that mixed up. Season of Trinity, green, Holy Trinity Sunday is white. What's the day of Pentecost going to be? Red, because when we celebrate the Holy Spirit, it's red. So that means the day of Reformation is also red. By the way, we celebrate Reformation at Zion always on the last Sunday in October because it's the Sunday closest to when we celebrate the Reformation. And what is the uh, kind of historical uh, celebration of when the Reformation begins? It's the same day Martin Luther writes the 95 Theses on the Castle Church door in Wittenberg, Germany. What's the date? October 31st. 1517. When did Luther write the small catechism? 1529. Law. What's the law? What we do for God and for our neighbor. What does the law do? Shows us our sins. What does the gospel do? Shows us our Savior. What is the gospel? What God does for us, for Jesus' sake. All right, we talk about verbal inspiration. The scriptures. The scriptures are verbally inspired. What does that mean? Every word and every verb is inspired by God. What does inerrancy mean? Without error. What are the six chief parts of the catechism? First we have the Ten Commandments. Then the Apostles' Creed. Then the Lord's Prayer. Then baptism. Then confession slash office of the keys. Sixth part, sacrament of the altar. What's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods. 
the Fermi. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Second commandment. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble. Pray, praise, and give thanks. All right. What's the law? What we do for God and for our neighbor. What does the gospel do? It shows us our Savior. Ah, see, I tried to trick you. What is the gospel? What God does for us for Jesus' sake. What does the law do? It shows us our sins. Always got to keep law and gospel distinct and separate. All right. Uh, I think we can get into stuff today. Let's go right into it. We're going to talk about, we are in class four once again. We are going to talk about an introduction to the sacraments, the nature of baptism, part one. That's your memory work. So we'll get to that in just a second. We're going to talk a little bit about sin. And then, if you are following along at home, you are going to need this introduction or a summary of baptism from the Lutheran Confessions. We're not going to read through the whole uh, thing, but there are some things that I always like to point out. And I made this document because I admit I at one time struggled with uh, the doctrine of baptism. I struggled with infant baptism, actually. And it was from reading. I uh, kept on reading. In fact, I had professors that say, you just got to keep on reading. And I did. And then I found the answers because Scripture is all telling. Scripture tells us everything we need to know. And Scripture gives us a clear definition of baptism, so we're going to talk a little bit about that insert. All right, so first things first. What's the memory work? Part one, baptism. What is baptism? Baptism is not just plain water. It is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. Which is that word of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And then you can stick an amen on the end of it. Okay, interesting thing. You'll hear in that Matthew 28 passage the exact same words that are spoken at our invocation in church. Invocation, calling upon God's name, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And also in the liturgy, that's when we are to make the sign of the cross. Because again, it reminds us of our baptisms. All right. So we are going to turn uh, right now in your catechisms to page 202. And we are going to talk first about what a sacrament is. Now, uh, I formerly would teach this kind of at the end of the year, but it's important if we're going to talk about baptism, we need to talk about the sacraments and what that means. So on page 236, the question, I'm sorry, question 236 on page 202. Remember, we got your ESV, Luther Small Catechism, 1991 edition. What is a sacrament? Well, a sacrament is a sacred act. It is a holy thing. Now, look at A, B, and C. You need to memorize this. This will not be on your first test, but this will be on your test later on, and you should know it very well by the time we get to that test. I think it's test four. Might be three. Can't remember. We've got a couple tests coming up, or we got a test coming up in a couple weeks. But first, uh, sacrament. There are three things required for something to be a sacrament. Look at A. It says instituted by God. So, of course, now we, now we might think we take this for granted, but we shouldn't. God has to institute it. Man can't make something like this up. A sacrament has to be instituted by God. Institutes means God creates it. God ordains it. God initiates it. God institutes it. So, instituted by God. B, in which God himself has joined his word of promise to a visible element. And C, by which he offers, gives, and seals the forgiveness of sins earned by Christ. So, I want you to underline the words, instituted by God. I want you to underline in B, visible element. And in C, I want you to underline the forgiveness of sins. So a sacrament needs to be instituted by God. It must have a visible element. And it's for the forgiveness of sins. Those three things are required for it to be a sacrament. And we are going to learn today that baptism is a sacrament because it's instituted by God. There's a visible element. And what's the visible element of baptism? Water. And it's for the forgiveness of sins because all who have been baptized are forgiven in Christ. We will talk more about that in a second. Okay, now look at the note. It says the word sacrament comes to us from the Latin Bible where it translates the Greek word mystery. Now that's interesting, right? Because you'd think like a mystery is something that we don't know or we don't know the truth. We can't figure it out. Well, in one sense, sacraments are mysteries because we can't understand how God's word and the water create uh, a new child. How, how does it actually make a baptized, how does, it, how does a baptism cause someone to be God's own child? 
Well, that's a mystery, right? It's a mystery because God says it's true and faith uh, just believes it. And remember what we learned about when it comes to the, the scripture being the teacher and reason being the student. So our reason can't understand how mere water, uh, and it's not mere water only, but it's how water and the word can make someone God's child or how even God himself is the one who baptizes the ch uh, child or adult, whoever it is that is baptized. Nevertheless, reason submits to God's word. Reason submits to scripture. because Scripture is the teacher. Reason is the student. So the Latin Bible, also known as the Vulgate, uh, translates the Greek word mystery as sacrament. And as we already said, a sacrament in the literal sense is holy things. The holy things, that which is holy. And what is something uh, required for it to be a sacrament? Instituted by God, visible element for the forgiveness of sins. Don't forget that. Let's go over our memory work again for today. What is baptism? Baptism is not just plain water, but the water included in God's command and combined with God's word, which is that word of God. Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's keep going on page 202. So we just learned about where the word sacrament comes from. And then we're going to read that second sentence underneath that note. At first, this word described all the saving truths of the faith, such as the Trinity, the Incarnation, the Redemption, the Church. Oh, the Church is even known as a mystery, and it is. Later, it was narrowed down to our present sense. Now, question 237. Okay, so what that basically means is, is, is typically now sacrament, the holy things, are specific to, when we refer to the sacraments, we talk about baptism, talk about the Lord's Supper, talk about absolution as kind of like a half or a two-third sacrament. We'll talk about more why uh, when we get to the sacraments, but just know that for now that our confessions speak of two or three sacraments, depending on uh, the usage of the definition of the term. But strictly speaking, this definition you just learned, I would say there's two, baptism and Lord's Supper, because there's no visible element in holy absolution. Holy absolution is God's word. It's for the forgiveness of sins. Christ institutes it, but there's nothing visible for our eyes to see. All right, uh, let's keep going. Question 237 on the top of page 203. So how many sacraments are there? And as we just said, by this definition, there are two sacraments, holy baptism and the Lord's Supper. And that note that you'll read there on page 203, I'll just read in case you don't have a catechism in front of you, is what I literally just said. Holy absolution is counted as a third sacrament, even though it has no divinely instituted visible element. Okay, so we already talked about that. Let's keep going. Question 238. Why are we to treasure the sacraments when water, bread, and wine are such common elements? And here's a quote from the large catechism. And now, the small catechism is written by Luther in 1529. The large catechism is a little bit bigger. That, hence, it's called the large catechism. And it goes into a little more thorough explanation of each of the six principal parts that we've learned uh, that are in the catechism. What are those six principal parts again? we got the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, Baptism, Confession, Office of the Keys, Confession slash Office of the Keys, and the Sacrament of the Altar is number six. Okay, so the large catechism is just a it's just a bigger version of the small. And here's a quote here. It says, The sacraments and all outward things that God ordains and institutes should not be considered according to the coarse, outward mask, the way we look at a nutshell, but we respect them because God's word is included in them. Okay, now let's go back to our memory work for today. The first part of baptism. What is baptism? Baptism is not just plain water, but it is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. So it is God's word that makes something a sacrament. We're going we're gonna to dig into that a little bit deeper in just a few moments. But it is important that it is not just plain water, but it is the water included in God's command meaning that God commands to use water and it's combined with God's word. Therefore, without God's word, it would just be water. And without the water, it would just be God's word. So we need the water and we need the word. And hence the first uh, part of our baptism in our, in our Sacrament of Holy Baptism, part one lesson today. Remember, this is class number four. Okay, so what is, do the member one more, one more time. What is baptism? Baptism is not just plain water. But it is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. Now I know that it's sometimes hard to remember uh, the order of the second half of that. But it is the water included in God's uh, command and combined with God's word. So remember that the included comes first because we have to understand that God's command includes there to be water. 
But it's also combined with God's word insofar as you can't have just the word and you can't have just the water. You've got to have both, a combination. So once again, baptism is not just plain water. It is, but it is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. And then we ask this question, well, which is that word of God? So if we're going to make a claim that God's word says, it, says this, where is it? And that's why it says, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you can throw an amen there on the end if you want to, because that's how it always happens in baptism. All right, so I think we've hammered out the memory work a little bit. You'll notice I'm saying this over and over again, because every Christian needs to know what their baptism means for them. Because it's the pure gospel. It's just like saying, I need to know what Jesus did for me. Well, I need to know what my baptism does for me. What God did for me in my baptism. All right, let's go to the top of page 205. So, question 239, what does the word baptize mean? Now, we all understand, this is no hidden secret, that the word baptize simply means to apply water. Whether it be by immersing, by washing, by pouring, and the like. That's what the reading says. Okay, so we technically uh, understand, so the word, if you just were to take the word baptiz baptizo in Greek, it just means to apply water. Now, it's become a technical term, so if you wanted to use an English grammar distinction, if you said to baptize in ancient times, you would get a small b. But if you were talking about baptism in the uh, official sense, we would put a capital B because it's a proper noun. It refers to something specific, a specific usage of the word baptize. So baptize as a verb, small b. Baptism is a thing. It's a proper noun, capital B. Okay. So baptism is that which Christ institutes. Remember, because for it to be a sacrament, God has to institute it, and Christ is God. So God institutes it. There's a visible element, the water, and it's for the forgiveness of sins. And again, we will talk about that a little bit more. All right. So question 240. Let's keep going. What is so special about the water of baptism? Here's another quote from that large catechism. It says, it is nothing other than a divine water. Not that the water in itself is nobler than other water, but that God's word and command are added to it. We've already kind of hammered that out. So let's keep going. Question 241. So who instituted holy baptism? Well, for it to be a sacrament, it has to be God. And, and hence the answer to this question. God himself instituted baptism. For our Lord Jesus Christ commanded his church to baptize all nations. And then that Bible verse 833 is what you memorized uh, in your memory work for today from Matthew chapter 28, the last chapter of Matthew. Christ the Lord says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So what does it mean? This is the next question, 242. What does it mean to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? Well, it means that in baptism, God, the Holy Trinity, receives me or anyone who is baptized into communion or fellowship with himself. So as we sing in the hymn, God's own child, I gladly say it, I am baptized into Christ. So God draws us. He brings us into his family through the waters of baptism because it's his promise. Now, in question 243, flipping the page to page 206, it says, Who is to baptize? And normally, the called ministers of Christ are to baptize, but in cases of emergency, and when no pastor is available, any Christian should baptize. And there's a note here. It says, For a short form of baptism in cases of emergency, see the end of this section. So there's a short form of a baptism in case of an emergency. And so what we can do is we can turn right to the end of baptism. And we're going to turn to page 216. We'll check that out. Okay, so page 216. You'll see right here. A short form for holy baptism in cases of emergency. So in urgent cases, in the absence of a pastor, any Christian may administer holy baptism. Take water, call the person by name, and apply the water, saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because we have to speak the three names of the Holy Trinity. If there is time, baptism may be preceded by the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer. The Apostles' Creed, by the way, is known as the Baptismal Creed, which is why we begin not only every class by, by confessing the Apostles' Creed, but why we are encouraged to start every day by confessing the Apostles' Creed. Because the Apostles' Creed is the Baptismal Creed. And just as we start every day by making the sign of the cross and being reminded of our baptism, being reminded that, in fact, we have been made God's own child, and we gladly say it, and we are going to live our lives this day reflecting that biblical truth 
and that eternal truth. So also we confess the creed, which was uh, spoken at our own baptisms. And we are reminded of the triune God, whose name we were baptized into, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the three parts of the creed reflect who those three persons of the Holy Trinity are. Okay, so why can a Christian uh, have an emergency baptism if a pastor is not present? Or why should a, a Christian uh, make sure that they step up if there isn't a pastor there to do it? Well, maybe the first question should be why typically do only pastors do it? Well, remember, and we are going to get this in many lessons from now, Christ institutes the office of the keys. And for the sake of good order, Christ institutes this office of the ministry where a pastor is called by a local congregation. So God calls this pastor through the church to publicly preach and teach the gospel and administer the sacraments. And so we have this wonderful doctrine of vocation, which means everyone has different jobs, okay? Everyone's got a different job. So everyone's busy doing something, right? Because um, we're all good workers. That's what we're taught in Scripture, to be good workers. Well, we need someone to be the person who publicly uh, performs all the functions of the ministry, preaching and teaching, God's word, administering the sacraments. And so a pastor is called to do it. So for the sake of good order, when a pastor can get there, then the pastor should be the one to baptize. And these baptisms should happen in church for the whole congregation to see. And because it's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful, it's, it's a wonderful gospel moment where God comes and baptizes this child or adult, whether child or adult. Now, someone might say, "Well, what is an example of an emergency? This is a child that might be born in the hospital that may only have hours or even minutes to live, and tragic things like that still do happen, of course. Or if someone later on in life, let's say they get in a car accident and they're bleeding out on the side of a highway." And someone stops and says, hey, have you been baptized? And they say, no. It can be done right there as long as there's some water, even from a bottle of water, aquafina, or whatever water you're drinking from. Uh, you can apply that water and, again, speak the name of the triune God. And, of course, we don't just do this willy-nilly. If it's an adult, we ask them, well, do you want to be baptized? And we don't just do, that, do it forcibly and uh, if they don't want it to be done. Uh, but still, there are certain there are cases where an emergency could come up. And in those situations, if someone's bleeding out on the highway, you can't say, well, hang on, stay alive for another 20 minutes so I can call my pastor so he can come over here. We know there's not time for that. And so we pray that these situations don't happen uh, in, insofar as like, we don't want someone, we don't want in these emergency situations. We do pray, of course, that God would make someone his child through the waters of baptism, even in the case of an emergency. I'm just saying we don't pray for emergencies to happen. I think you know what I mean there, but I want to be clear because this is going on the internet. All right, so in the cases of emergency, even you as a confirmant or you as an adult who's been maybe confirmed years ago and just you know reviewing uh, your own study of God's word uh, this day, uh, you can perform a baptism in the case of an emergency. But we should always defer to the sake of good order, have it be done in church, have, have the pastor do it, and specifically the pastor of the person who's being baptized. All right, so we talked about who is to baptize. Now let's talk a little bit about who is to be baptized. Let's go to question 244. All nations are to be baptized, that is, all people, young and old. Okay, now someone might ask, well, how does old people and young people, how are they included in the word nation? Because when I think of the word nation, I think of Russia or Sweden or Germany or Australia or Brazil or... Zaire, is that even a country still in Africa? I don't know. It used to be. Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I'm making a fool of myself. I can't, can't remember if Zaire is a country still or not. Ah, South Africa. There, I'm trying to hammer out all the, the continents. Canada, I think I'm nailed up. China, don't want to leave anybody out, you know? Don't, don't want to look like I'm, I'm getting in trouble. I don't want to get in trouble here. Um, okay, so all the continents of the world. We think those as nations, but it's not. The word nation in Greek refers to a people. Specifically, a people. And so, by someone saying, well, I don't think that babies are included in the word nations, then I would say, well, are you telling me that a, a baby isn't a person? A baby isn't a people or part of the people? And we know this to be true just from a secular perspective. For example, whenever a baby is born into a family, uh, or whenever a baby is born, whatever country they are born into, wherever, wherever that child is born, they are a citizen of that country. We know this. And sometimes there's dual citizenship examples where the mother is one uh, from one country, the father's from another, and this child is born with dual citizenship. And we have examples of this. And so that right, so to speak, that inherent uh, uh, citizenship is given to that child at his or her birth. It means that they are part of that nation, right? They are part of that people. So also, 
in the command to baptize, the burden of proof on someone who says babies aren't included is to prove to me that somehow babies aren't a part of the country. And we know this. This is a census year. When people are taking, uh, they're taking a census of a household, you count every living person in the house, including babies. Why would we not include them? We know this to be true in the secular world. How much more so when it comes to God's gifts and God's gift of baptism that he gives and he offers to all people, all nations. All right, hopefully that answers that question. Let's keep going. Question 245. What distinction is to be made in baptizing? A. Those who can receive instruction are to be baptized after they have been instructed in the main articles of the Christian faith. So excluding emergency situations, it would be the assumption that if an adult, for an example, or even a child uh, who is older and can, think, and, and can speak uh, for themselves, uh, if they want to receive baptism, it's important to instruct them. We, it's not an emergency, so we should instruct them into what they are being baptized into. Now in the case of babies, uh, let's go to question B before I get ahead, or a letter B before I get ahead of myself. It says, little children should be baptized when they are brought to baptism by those who have authority over them, referring to, uh, in usual cases, a mother and a father, or in extenuating circumstances, maybe it's a, a grandmother and a grandfather, depending on if the mother and father are not available uh, to be uh, the parental figure in that child's life. <clears throat> now, what's important to make clear here, it is, is not the parent's faith that will save that child. But it is important that the parent's faith will bring that child to baptism. And it is assumed that the parent's faith will have instructed that child, even in the womb, whether it was singing hymns to that child, or praying for that child, or bringing that child to church in utero, so the child could hear the hymns that were being sung, hear the word that was being proclaimed. And so it is not, again, the parent's faith that saves the child. The parent will speak for the child, since the infant is not able to speak for it self. But it is important here once again to be reminded that it is God's act that causes the baptism and God gives what he promises to give in baptism, whether it's to the old, to the old or to the young. Okay? All right. I hope I said everything I wanted to say there. So it's important to make that distinction once again that God's gift is still for that child and that it's not somehow given to the parents and then by extension given to the child. Okay? But when a parent acts in faith, it is an act of faith for a parent to bring their child uh, to the waters of baptism. And, and we can take comfort in that, knowing that as the vows the parents make, they are going to teach this child the Christian faith. They are going to bring them to church. That's the assumed. Uh, that's, we, why would we not assume that? Right? Okay. Now, we know, that, of course, this sometimes isn't true, and those parents need to be brought to repentance. Uh, but, but nevertheless, uh, that, that, is, that is the assumption. All right, let's go. Question uh, 246 on page 207. Babies are to be baptized because, A, they are included in the word all nations. We already talked about this. B, Jesus invites little children to come to him. C, as sinners, babies need what baptism offers. We're going to talk about why babies are sinners in just a few moments. And then D, babies also are able to have faith. So even babies can have faith. Now, Faith is going to look different in an infant than it will an adult. An adult can articulate their faith. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's an intellectual thing, too. Uh, now, saving faith is a trust, right? It's trust. But it's a little more, um, trust is different for an adult uh, than it is for a child, insofar as uh, the child, so I'll just give you an example of my babies, uh, my, my, my infant children that I've had, is uh, if, I, if my children are screaming and crying for food and I pick them up, they know, Daddy's not the one who can provide the food. That's mommy. So they go to mommy, they instantly start crying because they know, ah, mommy's going to feed me. They trust that mommy's going to the one, that mommy's going to be the one to feed them. And they know mommy's the one that's going to feed them. They know also daddy's not the one that's going to feed them. And so also a baby's trust. So in that way, it's the same. The trust is the same between a baby and an adult. It's just there's an intellectual difference in the way we articulate that. But it's saving faith nonetheless. It is trust and the promise that, and so the Christian, infant, the infant Christian, trusts and knows its Heavenly Father. The sheep always know their Savior's voice. And how we know this to be true, it's, it's a mystery, but God makes a promise. And when God makes a promise, what? Reason submits to God's word. All right, um, let's go to question 247. This is the last one before we'll go on to sin. Question 247, why does the church encourage the use of sponsors at baptisms? Sponsors witness that those who receive this sacrament have been properly baptized. They also pray for them and, in the case of children, help with their Christian upbringing, especially if they should lose their parents. Only those of the same confession of faith 
should be sponsors. So when you are picking sponsors, perhaps maybe uh, and someday, you know, and whether you're a youth and you know, someday you'll have to you'll have children of your own that you're going to have to pick sponsors. It's important to pick someone who shares the same confession of faith, especially and most importantly, they confess the creed to be true because that's the baptism of creed. And also, that they confess that it's important to baptize babies because God's word says so, right? Because babies are included in the word all nations, and they're all included in God's wonderful promises for all of humanity. And you don't want to have someone who's against those things. Maybe they don't believe in the creed, or maybe they don't believe in infant baptism. In fact, I've had that happen before. Right before a baptism, I talked to a sponsor, and they said, I, I don't believe in infant baptism. I said, then you can't be a sponsor. There's no shame in that. Don't come stand up. Don't stand up. It's okay. I'll go, I'll go talk to the parents if, if, if you're worried about it, because they would be lying and be making a false confession. We shouldn't encourage that. All right, so uh, there, there we're, we're with baptism. Now what we're going to do is we are going to go to page 98. We're going to talk a little bit about sin and why we need baptism. So let's go to page 98 in our catechisms. <clears throat> Question 78. What is sin? Pause me if you need to. So question 78, now on page 98. What is sin? Well, sin is every thought, word, desire, and deed that is contrary to God's law. I want you to circle by verse 252, as I've been having you do. And it's 1 John 3, 4. Put a slash before, uh, for the last, well, underline the last three words, and you can put a slash right before, because this is what you need to know. Sin is lawlessness. So when lawlessness would be breaking God's law, and that is sin. And that would be lawless, right? If you're not abiding by the law, you are lawless. Sin is lawlessness. So sin goes against God's law, as revealed in God's word. And remember, how does God give us... Uh, his law, there's three ways, on the heart, on two tablets of stone, and in scripture. Right. Okay. So, and remember that. You need to know that. Three ways God uh, gives us the law. On the heart, two tablets of stone, and in scripture. All right. Who brought sin into the world? Question 79. The devil did. The devil brought sin into the world by tempting Adam and Eve, who of their own free will yielded to the temptation. So you can't say, the devil made me do it. All right, you have you have no excuse. I mean, Adam and Eve tried that; didn't work out too well for him. All right, if you sin, when you sin, not if you sin, when you sin, it's your fault. We are each held accountable for our own sins. When I sin, it's my fault. All right. Uh, question eighty: How many kinds of sin are there? You need to know this for your test. Uh, how many kinds of sin are there? There's two kinds of sin: original and actual. So there's two kinds of sin: original and actual. What's original sin? Question 81. Original sin is that total corruption of our whole human nature that we have inherited from Adam through our parents. Adam, of course, referring to Adam in the garden. Adam and Eve in the garden. Before the fall, and when they take the bite of the uh, fruit that they were forbidden to eat, that sin came into the world. And look at Bible verse Romans 5.12 on top of page 99. Bible verse 257. Circle that one. It says, Sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. So because of Adam, all men sin, and we all have original sin. It's now an, a, a, a virus, so to speak, uh, a, a consequence of, of, of the fall of humankind, and is a foreign thing that has affected our human nature and, in, and in infects us all. Uh, put a star next to Bible verse 255, by the way. It's on the bottom of page 98. Psalm 51, verse 5, it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So you don't have to memorize it, but it's a good verse to know. All right, so what has original sin done to human nature? We kind of alluded to this a little bit already. There's three consequences of original sin. A, it has brought guilt and condemnation to all people. So it condemns all people. B, it has left everyone without true fear and love of God. That is, spiritually blind, dead, and enemies of God. So, it condemns all people, it leaves us spiritually blind, dead, and God's enemy, and then C, it causes everyone to commit all kinds of actual sins. So again, original sin has three consequences. It condemns all people, it leaves us spiritually blind, dead, and God's enemy, and it causes us to sin. Those are three pretty significant consequences, right? This is why we need to be baptized, because every single person born has original sin. And sin is real. Original sin is real sin. It is a real thing that affects us all. And so, and so, in baptism, we need that forgiveness right away. That's why we shouldn't put off baptism. We shouldn't put it off for months at a time. Oh well, I need Grandma Schmidt to come. Oh, I need to make sure Uncle Charlie can come. I need to make sure Aunt 
Janice can come. Nope. Got to make sure. I don't know why I picked those names. First names that popped into my head. I know people buy those names, and that's the names that popped in my head. So now you're YouTube stars. Shouldn't even joke about that, because I'm not doing that for that purpose. I'm doing this only for the sake of getting the word out to as many people as we possibly can at Zion, and hoping that we can have a strengthening of faith, because remember, that's the purpose of confirmation. Confirmatio, right? Strengthening of faith. Okay, so original sin condemns all people. It leaves us spiritually blind, dead, and God's enemy, and it causes us to sin. So it causes us further sin. I want you to put a star next to... Uh, Bible verse 261, right here in the middle of the page, Genesis 8.21. This is a great verse that teaches us um, the consequence of original sin. It says, The intentions of man's heart is evil from his youth. This is such a great verse because a lot of people like to deny original sin. Oh, they see little kids misbehaving and they say, Oh, all kids will be kids. Oh, all boys will be boys. It's terrible. And when they're acting terrible, it's because of sin. And they are sinning. Because if, if they're acting terrible, they're disobeying somebody. They're disobeying someone. You know that to be true. And this is a reminder to us that even in the early, even in the early book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 8, the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Evil from his youth. So even when they're young, the man's heart is evil. Why? Because children, boys and girls, they're self-centered. They care about me, myself, and I. And that needs to be repented of. It's, they may... They, just like their first parents, Adam and Eve in the garden, want to make themselves uh, their own idol, their own God, and, 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 and have the knowledge uh, that God has. And again, this is why baptism is so important. Uh, we need to be cleansed from all sin and, un and unrighteousness. All right, let's flip the page. So, remember, what are the two types of sin? Original and actual. Now we're going to talk about actual sin. So question 83 on the top of page 100. Actual sin is every act against the commandment of God in thoughts, desires, words, or deeds. Now, this is going to be a little bit confusing, but we're going to try to keep these things clear. I'm going to say, I'm going to ask you on your test, because this is definitely going to be on your test, because it's important to know. What are the two types of sin? Original and actual. And then I'm going to ask you, what are the two types of actual sin? So original sin is what we are inherited from our, uh, uh, we what we inherit from our first parents. And again, what is it? what are the three consequences? Remember what they are? Condemns all people, leaves us spiritually blind, dead, and God's enemy, and causes us to sin. So it causes us to do the actual sins. So the two types of sin, original and actual, and the actual sins, the two types are sins of commission and sins of omission. And that is actually written on, uh, right here, i try to put two fingers on it, on question 83. Underline that. So sins of commission first and sins of omission. And here are the two Bible verses that support those things. So we've got first, James 1.15. Then desire, so remember, uh, an actual sin is every thought, desire, word, or deed. When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So these are the things that we actually do, or the things we actually say, or the things we actually think. Those are sins of commission. All those thoughts, words, and deeds, as we say in uh, confession in the hymnal, any, all those thoughts, words, and deeds that are contrary to God's law, that we think, say, or do, those are sins of commission, things that we commit, things that we do. Now, equally sinful are our sins of omission. So look at James 4, 17, Bible verse 269. You don't need to memorize these, by the way. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. All right, so these are all the things that we should do that we don't. So, for example, we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And too often, we don't. We omit doing that. We should call upon God's name in every trouble. Pray, praise, and give thanks. Too often, we don't. Too often, we don't pray to God. We don't give him our praise. We don't give him our thanks. And then we're going to get this through all these commandments. There's things that we're supposed to do in each of the commandments that we fail to do. We fail to help our neighbor on the second table of the law. Because remember, the first table of the law is between who? Us and God. Commandments 1 through 3 are between us and God. The second table of the law, commandments 4 through 10, are between who? Man and man. Remember the arrows? Horizontally, man to man, second table of the law, commandments 4 through 10. Commandments 1 through 3 are between us and God. The arrow goes up and down. And so we fail to do the things that we're supposed to do for God and for our neighbor. Because remember, that's the law. What's the law? What we do for God and for our neighbor. And what does the law do? It shows us our sins. And so when we fail to do the things that we're supposed to do, it shows us our sins. And it, those are sins of omission. So we omit to, from doing them. 
we need to repent of those as well. And there are so many things that we do or that we forget to do or that we don't even know that we're supposed to do. And those and so there's oftentimes, and I think if you know if, you, if the Christian had a checklist of each day, you know, how many sins of commission versus sins of omission. Usually the Christian has more sins of omission than they have of commission. And a lot of them we don't even know. The psalmist says, I think it's Psalm 19, who can discern his errors? We sin so often we don't even realize how often it is. It's kind of like in a divine service, a worship service. You know, right in the beginning of the service, you know, if anyone, we might think, we very well might think, we make it through a whole worship service without sinning. Oh, but I'm sure there was at one point where we stopped listening. Or there's something the pastor preached that we said, ah, I don't know if I, I don't believe that. All those things are sins, right? Um, or if we're just failing to listen in the first place, that's a sin of omission. You know, maybe we're distracted with the kids in the pew or the kid so in someone else's pew. We're failing to listen, sins of omission. All right. Uh, I think that's it for uh, the catechism here. Um, so what we're going to do now, uh, right here, uh, toward the tail end of our, our, our study here today, is uh, the summary of baptism from the Lutheran Confessions. Now, if you have this, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But there's a few things I want to point out. So halfway down the first page, uh, I'm going to point out most of the things that are underlined uh, in this document. So it says, in the first place, you must note that these words stand. God's commandment and institution. So let us not doubt that baptism is divine. You must note in these words that here stands God's commandment and his institution. So in other words, when it comes to baptism, we're going kind to of, we're we're kind of make a full circle back to baptism. God makes the rules. So if God commands it, we must do it. And we must do it the way he, do, he tells us to do it. And he also institutes it. And so because he institutes it, it's his baptism. It's not our baptism. Just like when we get to the Lord's Supper, it's the Lord's Supper. It's not our supper. We don't get to make the rules. God makes the rules. All right, now go down to the bottom of page one, if you're following along. And I, I'm just talking about the second place. So first thing we need to know, it's divine. God's command, God's institution, he makes the rules. In the second place, we must also learn why and for what purpose baptism is instituted. To state it most simply, state it this way. The power, work, profit, fruit, and purpose of baptism is this. To save. That's 1 Peter 3.21. You should memorize that verse. Baptism now saves you. Baptism now saves you. Now, here's the thing. A lot of times people want to say, well, baptism doesn't save. Well, then they're telling me that 1 Peter 3.21 doesn't count. And it does count. It's God's word. And God's word is true. It's inerrant. It's without error. So, if baptism now saves you, and we understand that baptism actually saves, then how do we understand baptism in light of this truth? And that's the question we always have to ask. Is It's not our job to prove that baptism saves. We don't have to prove that. God's word has proved that. God's word says, baptism now saves you. And remember, reason submits to the truth of God's word. Scripture is the teacher. Reason is the student. And so therefore, because Scripture says, baptism saves, therefore, our understanding of baptism has to be in light of that truth. And if that's the way we think about baptism, then that properly orders us in the way that we need to think about baptism the rest of the way. And so if we have any ways of thinking that somehow I contribute to my baptism or I make my baptism, etc., or baptism is my work or it's an outward work of an inward reality or however the, or any other church body tries to wrap their heads around it, it's blatantly wrong because it contradicts 1 Peter 3.21 where it says baptism now saves you. And if it's anything that we do, then you would also have to say that our salvation is based on our works. And if you are a biblical believing Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, you have to outrightly reject that because we know salvation is by God's grace, through faith. All right, let's keep going. Page two. Halfway down, you'll see another uh, something that's underlined, and I just was talking about this, and I wanted to point this out. And by the way, this is from the large catechism, so this is what we confess to be true um, as, as Bible-believing uh, Christians, specifically known as Lutherans. Uh, what we have here is this underlined, uh, and then in the third place. So in the first place, remember, div uh, it's divine. God's command, God's institution. God makes the rules. Number two, once again, uh, what's its purpose? Its purpose is to save. Now in the third place, uh, Luther writes, Let us see who the person is that receives what baptism gives and profits. Faith alone makes the person worthy to receive profitably the saving divine water. They cannot be received any other way than by believing them with the heart. Without faith it profits nothing, even though baptism in, is in itself a divine overwhelming treasure. That's important. Without faith, it proffers nothing. 
But here's where we're getting to the important part and what I wanted to point out and what I have underlined. Our works indeed do nothing for salvation. Baptism, however, is not our work, but God's. God's works are saving and necessary for salvation. They do not exclude faith, but demand faith. For without faith, they could not be grasped. Okay, so here's the reality. God makes the command. God institutes. God does the work in baptism. What's faith's role then? Faith receives the promise. Now, what does this look like? So imagine God standing in a room. And he's got water and he's got his word. And he baptizes you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And that's what he does. So even though the pastor is a human vessel, it's God who does the baptizing. And he says, you are baptized. And baptism saves you. What is faith's role? It simply says, yes, Lord, I believe it. I believe it to be true. That's faith's role. It simply nods its head in affirmation and it says, yes, Lord, I trust what you say. So that's faith's role in baptism, okay? So again, baptism is not our work, but God's work. Faith is required, but faith doesn't make the baptism. God's word makes the baptism. God's word makes it. The water and the word combine. Remember, what is baptism? Baptism is not just plain water. It is water included in God's command and combined with God's word. So God's word makes the baptism. The water and the word together make the baptism. Faith receives its blessings. Faith hangs on to the promises. Faith is the organ that, that, that receives the promise. Just like my mouth is the organ which receives the food that comes in, right? My mouth is, is, is the, the receptacle that receives water and, and food, food and water. Faith is the organ that receives the forgiveness of sins that's attached to, to baptism. And how do we know that there's a forgiveness of sins attached to baptism? Because it says baptism now saves you. And where there is salvation, there must be forgiveness. For there cannot be salvation apart from forgiveness because we are sinful. Remember, we just talked about sin. We have original sin. We do it. We commit actual sin. And we omit actual sin, right? We, we, we omit to do, do the things we do. We commit the things we're not supposed to do. And so we need forgiveness. And so if baptism saves, that must mean that baptism offers forgiveness and faith receives that forgiveness of sins. All right, let's turn to page three. So, in underline here, we're just talking about this. The first main paragraph, it says, Further, we say that we are not very concerned to know whether the person baptized believes or not. For baptism does not become invalid on that account. So the baptism is still real and good and whole because it has God's word. And where God's word makes a promise, it keeps it. So where there is the word and there is the water, there is a baptism. So faith, so baptism does not become invalid on that account. But everything depends on God's word and command. I'm reading now. For my faith does not make baptism, but receives it. That's what I've underlined, and that's what you need to know. My faith does not make a baptism, it receives it. God's word makes the baptism, because his command, is so his institution, right? Where's that thing on the first page? His command, his institution, its purpose is to save, and if it purposes to save, that means it offers the forgiveness of sins, because there cannot be salvation without the forgiveness of sins. And so my faith does not make baptism, it receives it. It merely trusts it to be true. All right. Let's go down to the bottom. I and my neighbor, uh, not the bottom, but second to the last paragraph. I and my neighbor, and in short, all people may err and deceive, but God's word cannot err. So where God makes a promise, where God's word said something, it must be true. And here at the bottom, on page three, so a truly Christian life is another, nothing other than a daily baptism. And so this is the point I wanted to make to you today, is that baptism, yes, it's a one-time event. Right? It happens one time in our life. We should never be rebaptized. That would be sinful because that means we would be denying the gift that God gave to us. Because remember, what is a baptism? It's what it's where God's word is present uh, with the water, right? So we should never be rebaptized. That would be sinful. It would be, it would be dis discarding God's word and God's promise. And it would be saying, it would be making baptism my work. It would be making it what I do. It would be making it about me. But it's not about me. It's about God and God's word. My faith doesn't make a baptism. It receives it. Um, but again, uh, so, how do I live my baptism then? We're going to turn the page. It says, therefore, if you live in repentance, you walk in baptism. So go back to page 3 for just a second. So a Christian life, a truly Christian life, is nothing other, other than a daily baptism. This doesn't mean we go back to the font each day and have the water uh, put back over us. No, instead, a Christian life is a daily baptism insofar as we begin each day making the sign of the cross, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and we cling to our baptism. We cling to the promise God made there. We continue to repent of our sins. And this, by the way, is why confession of sins is so important. Because it keeps, when we confess our sins, whether it's going privately to the pastor to confess them, or whether it's we confess them in church uh, before God and his altar, 
what we are doing is when we confess those sins, we acknowledge, I have not lived up to the expectations uh, that you have for me, O Lord. And yet, through the waters of baptism, you have been you have made me your child, and as I was washed in the waters of baptism then, so can I continue to cling and hold steadfast to that, that gospel truth that I am forgiven now because of my baptism. I repent of my sins, and I trust in you for forgiveness. And so therefore, if you live in repentance, that's living your baptism. That's walking in your baptism. So you don't need to be rebaptized again. You just keep clinging to the first baptism that you had in the first place. And even if you don't remember it, that's probably even better. So some people say, I want to remember my baptism. And as an infant, I don't remember mine at all. I don't need to remember my baptism in the, in the physical sense. Like I don't need to have, remember being there. What I need to remember in my baptism is the promises God attaches to it. That's what's important. I need to remember that at that font, God made a promise. You are my child. Yes, Lord. I nod my head in the ferment, right? We come full circle back to that reality. Faith doesn't make baptism. Faith receives baptism. God's word cannot err. And if he promises to save us, baptism now saves you. And there must be the forgiveness of sins attached because there's no way of getting to heaven without forgiveness. We know that to be true from elsewhere in Scripture. Remember, Scripture interprets Scripture. All right. So that is it for that little handout here. And uh, as we close, we are going to once again do our routine. But we didn't do the hymn at the beginning, so we're going to do the hymn at the end. I decided to switch it up a little bit. But before we be, uh, close, let's, uh, let's pray Psalm 23 together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Luther's Evening Prayer I thank thee, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this day from all harm and danger. Oh, I pray, I'm praying that wrong. I, I, sorry. I thank thee, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously... Get, no, I'm doing it wrong again. Oh, this is embarrassing. Oh, I was right. Oh, silly me. I was right the whole time. Thank thee, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to turn to our hymn, hymn 766, and let's sing. Our Father, who from heaven above Bids all of us to live in love As members of one family And pray to you in unity Teach us no thoughtless words to say But from our inmost hearts to pray your name be hallowed, help us, Lord, in purity to keep your word, that to the glory of your name we walk before you free from blame. Let no false teaching us pervert, all poor deluded souls convert. Your kingdom come, guard your domain, and your eternal righteous reign. The Holy Ghost enrich our day, with gifts attendant on our way. Break Satan's power, defeat his rage. Preserve your church from age to age. All right, we did a little extra verse there. We did three verses. Remember, keep singing it. I'm memorizing it with you, and we'll learn it together. But God be with you, brothers and sisters in Christ. So for next time, we'll be diving into uh, lesson number five, and then class number six, by the way, is the test. So we're going to be 
skipping lesson six, and it'll technically be called lesson seven uh, for the online videos. Obviously, we won't be having the test on here. But for next time, the homework due at the beginning of the class is the third and fourth commandments and meaning. So learn them both. Uh, learn commandments three and four, and we'll see you then.